It's the week ending Saturday the 28th of October and this is The Week Unwrapped. In the past seven days, we've seen two Republican senators breaking rank and criticising President Trump, Catalonia edging closer to direct rule from Spain, and secret files concerning President Kennedy's assassination being released into the public for the first time. But we're here to bring you some of the stories that passed under the radar this week. Big news, not making headlines right now, but with repercussions for all our lives. I'm Ollie Mann. Let's unwrap the week. And with me from the week's digital team are Holden Frith, Mike Starling and Rebecca Gilley. And starting the show this week, it's Rebecca. What do you think this week will be remembered for? Now hiring for a white Martin Luther King. Well, the reason I came with my gun today was because the white people are being targeted. There are several groups out against white people. I, I practice my Second Amendment rights and I brought it here to protect me and my family. Protesters in downtown Dallas calling themselves White Lives Matter, talking to Dallas Morning News last year. So, Rebecca, what's happened this week? This week, there was a survey that appeared on NPR that showed that 55% of white Americans think that they are the victims of racial discrimination in the US in 2017. They surveyed lots of different racial ethnic groups and a majority of all of them said that their own group was a victim of racial discrimination. Obviously, it's the the majority of white people statistic that has been picked up a little bit as a, a bit incongruous. As a bit of a bombshell. As a, yeah. Yes. I mean, <laughs> Most white people think they're discriminated against. But let's try and break it down, yes. Rebecca, because we're not a hysterical show. Of course not. We like to give people detail, deep yes. dive. Why do you think this result was ascertained? I mean, there's been a lot in the US, there's been a lot of talk about how white malaise was behind Trump's popularity and eventually his accession to the presidency. There are real life manifestations that there is a growing sentiment among white people that they are somehow getting the the, the rough end of the stick. On Saturday, there's going to be two White Lives Matter rallies in Tennessee, organised by the same group, Unite the Right, who organised the rally in Charlottesville in August so there is definitely a growing segment of people who do subscribe to the idea that white people are discriminated against and some of them are willing to take to the streets and protest about this discrimination. I mean, just the fact that it is a right-wing group who are organising those protests suggests that this is just a Republican concern. But if the majority of white people say they think white people are being discriminated against, then presumably that's people who voted for Hillary Clinton as well. Yeah, and the NPR survey found that the biggest indicator among the re- respondents was actually class, with lower and lower middle income Americans far more likely to say that white people experience discrimination than more well-off Americans, whereas 55% agreed in principle that white people were discriminated against. Far fewer numbers reported actually experiencing racial discrimination. 19% said they had experienced it in hiring, 13% in promotions and workplace opportunities and lower numbers for other things. And far higher people, white and black, I think, said that they acknowledge black people are discriminated against more. It just seems that everyone in America feels discriminated against. 92% of black people said that there was discrimination against black people in US society, which I think is probably, I'm surprised it wasn't 100. Holden, what do you think is going on here? I think as Rebecca was saying that there is an element of class here, but also an element of status. And I think people have the sense that status is zero sum in the way that economics maybe aren't. So two competing groups can both end up richer and both feel comfortable with that. But if one group is gaining in status, it often feels to the people who's who are being overtaken or drawn level with that they must be losing status there. I mean, the examples that were given, actually, Mike, which is quite interesting by a lot of the respondents as to why they felt white people were being discriminated against, is they'd say, oh, I went for a job and a black guy got it. And you kind of think, well, I mean, possibly you did work for an organisation where they didn't have any black executives next rung up the ladder and that that was a positive point on his or her application. But on the other hand, if you ask black people, they're <laughs> much more likely to say that that's happened to them. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the, say, look at the actual report deep down, everybody says their own, their own race or eth- ethnicity is actually discriminated against. And I think, looking at the reports coming off it, GQ's Jack Moore points out that the question is here, is that white people believe that other white people 
have been discriminated against and that's not the not actually themselves and i think that's the key talking point here <laughs> to pick up off of what holden was saying there about zero about status being a zero-sum game lindy west wrote a really good piece in the new york times earlier this week that it was about the harvey weinstein case but she sort of brought it more out into the general aura of entitlement around white men like as a class and in it she's talking about donald trump becoming president and saying to some men There is no injustice so unnaturally, viscerally grotesque as a white man being fired. Donald Trump, predator-in-chief, seems to view the election of Barack Obama as a white man being fired. So she kind of draws that economic insecurity, that feeling of I'm losing out to other ethnic groups and it's very easy to do as well you know and if you feel like you're suffering on an economic level it's natural to look around for solutions and people who look different to you are the obvious target because you can't look around and physically see the signs of capitalism not working or the signs of being left behind by government in a way that you can see groups who look different from you who maybe weren't there before so I think it's very understandable. I've just got back from South Africa and this sort of question is extremely acute there. I have family who's South African, they're white South African, and speaking to them, speaking to friends there, you would get the impression that white South Africans are by far the most discriminated against group there, even though most of the people I was speaking to have jobs, cars, houses, in some cases very well-paying jobs and expensive cars and houses. But that's because they they hear the government saying we need to fight for the rights of the black South Africans. Also, I think it does come back again to status in a certain way in that they, as a group, used to have a protected status that meant they were automatically, even at the lowest level of white South African society, there was a group, consciously or unconsciously, and in lots of cases consciously, they could look down on as being below them. That's no longer the case, so there is that greater sense of having to compete with a a lot more people. In America and in Britain, I think that sort of idea is much more deeply buried. It's not, you know, people don't talk about it in the same overt way, except perhaps in the clip we just heard. I think that is something in the back of our minds, in the kind of deep recesses of our reptile brain that comes out in the circumstances where somebody is in economic stress, where they're feeling under pressure. The natural response is to kind of try and establish your status and the easiest way of doing that is to be able to look down on somebody else as a lower status and as Rebecca said race is a very obvious and evident way of identifying somebody. It's not necessarily a recent phenomenon as well like lots of people have been tying it to Donald Trump and the way he played on white insecurities but it was Lyndon B. Johnson who said this the secret to political success was to convince the lowest white man he's better than the best coloured man. You know, and once you've got that division, it prevents organisation along class lines as well. If, if you exploit those racial divisions, then it does distract the working class from working together. Is there something that we have to take responsibility for as well as our London liberal media elite here in the UK? Because I often get the sense, it's quite hard to sort of describe this exactly, but I often get the sense that because over the last 20, 30 years, there has rightly been a project in the media to say, let's promote some black newscasters. Let's make sure that there are characters in soap operas that are of every ethnicity because we want to reflect the public who are watching the TV, listening to the radio and everything else. But because of that, there's possi- it possibly amplifies the sense that that is being done in a slightly artificial way, that it hasn't just evolved, that someone somewhere, some liberal guy has made a decision. Mm. That's what it often comes down to, isn't it? People in power are making decisions about who should be getting jobs and it might be based on their colour and that's a decision against me. Yes, and I've got I've got a little last you know last minute twist in the tail here towards the idea that perhaps the idea that white people are discriminated against isn't completely unfounded in some respects. I was trying to look for a sim- any see if any similar studies or surveys have been done for the UK, and as far as I can see, they haven't. But YouGov did one in 2015 where they asked people to they gave them like a list of different ages, ethnicities, for instance, you know, a Pakistani man in his 30s or a, a Chinese woman in her 50s, and they had to pick what they were most likely to do of positive and negative attributes such as being polite or being hardworking or conversely taking drugs or, you know, being physically aggressive. They subtracted one from the other, if you see what I mean. And the people who were viewed most positively overall were actually white women in their 60s followed by white men in their 60s. But the most derided ethnic group and gender and age was white men in their 20s were rated the most likely to participate in negative behaviour and the least likely to participate in positive behaviour. So I think when you drill down and divide it by 
other factors like age and gender, there is certainly an element of prejudice. You just have to look at the way that chavs were demonised. It's not so common now, but it was common a few years ago. And the way that we do often hear about how white working class boys are performing worst at school. So I think there is definitely, if you drill it down, there's definitely work that needs to be done to reach out to that demographic. And that's also a more acceptable prejudice to express than a a prejudice against black or ethnic minority people. So I I imagine in that kind of self-reporting survey, Mm. and you're asked to characterise behaviour looking at various different colours of skin, people are much, even if they they were being entirely honest, they might have a negative association with a black man or an Asian man. Mm. They're more likely to censor that than they are against a white working class man age 20. Yeah, and while like there's negative perceptions, I don't think we can really see any evidence that they're affecting white people's status as a class or their income. It was reported recently that white people earn £2 per hour more on average than black people. While it may not have those real life consequences of discrimination against minority racial groups, I think it does explain to a certain extent why some white people, particularly young white men, may feel that they are discriminated against. And it doesn't help, does it, to put all those people into... Hillary Clinton's basket of deplorables, does it? I mean, actually, if you honestly answer the question, are white people discriminated against? And actually, if I was asked that question, I might think, well, gypsies are often discriminated against, they're white. So I might answer yes without meaning. Therefore, the biggest problem in society is white people are discriminated against. I'm just honestly answering the question. There's a problem with putting all the people who answered yes to that question and saying, well, they're part of the white lives matter. They're basically racist, that brigade of people. I mean, that's not true, is it? No, and I think think part of the complexity here is distinguishing between discrimination against an individual and discrimination against a group. So as you were suggesting, Ollie, you might have a white individual who has lost out on a particular job because they're part of a group that is massively overrepresented in a particular company. And that is an injustice in that particular case. It's an injustice that's trying to redress a greater injustice in society or company as a whole. But to the person who has missed out on that job, it feels like a personal slight. And they're also always going to remember that as a part of the bigger picture. It has to be, you know, the, a quota system. I've worked in a quota system before in the Middle East, and it was very strange. Where it's like, if you have someone, oh, they've got that passport, they earn a bit more, or we need someone from that nationality because they're better with working with people. It's a strange phenomenon. But, like, I think you have to look at the class issue. And the same everywhere. People who are poor are going to speak out, and they're going to feel like the world's against them, aren't they? There's a lot in neuroscience, isn't there, about how we humans have a kind of pack mentality, that however much we try and evolve beyond it, actually, at root level, we identify with other people who look like us, and you actually have to actively block out that signal. I mean, I think we can probably all agree that it is a case now that society has to evolve, but that's a hard challenge to get right. Yeah, I mean, I think at the core, it's about alleviating the economic pressure and the stresses that cause people to revert to that kind of instinctive mentality, which, as you say, I think is ingrained in all of us, like deep down. But I think, you know, the research has consistently shown that more well-off socially democratic countries are more open, more tolerant, less prone to violent crime, etc. So I think that, that that does show that the key to it really is making sure that everyone is as economically stable as they can be and it ta- and that does take away some of those triggers for for racial or ethnic grievances if you look back at 2008's financial crisis i think that is where all the issues in the world have come from to be fair <laughs> because everyone companies have been skinned people have lost houses people have lost jobs and that has been the biggest downfall for the right-wing groups to prey upon. And I think this is the issue, that if people have got a bit more cash in their pocket and are a bit happier, yeah, generally society is a better place. I think people are less anxious about status if they feel that they're getting richer. It's when they feel that they're getting poorer that they want to feel that somebody else is in a worse position than they are. Build a wall. (laughs) Holden, it's your turn. What do you think this week will be remembered for? I've learnt that money and happiness, like time and space, are matters of relativity. Scientists and artists, through their works, frequently have had enduring influence even in the realm of politics. But in order to influence the course of political events directly, one must also have the gift to influence people and their actions directly. This is rather a matter of arousing and using emotions and personal confidence of clear understanding of causal connections. For this reason, intellectuals have little chance to impress an audience. 
How amazing is that? Albert Einstein speaking in a US public information film back in 1940. Holden, how is this possibly topical this week? To work out why this is relevant now, we actually have to go further back in time to 1922. Okay. When Einstein was staying in a hotel in Tokyo and a courier delivered him a message. He either didn't have the money to tip the courier or the courier refused the money. And instead, Einstein gave him a handwritten note which read... A calm and humble life will bring more happiness than the pursuit of success and the constant restlessness that comes with it. The reason this is relevant this week is that it was sold at auction for $1.5 million. Get away. $1.5 million for a handwritten note with some con philosophy on it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'd say it's a great guy and everything. Wow, that's a hell of a tip. I suppose you have to wait a long time for it to come through. It, it was actually his son who sold it. So um, you know, we don't know whether the, the courier did lead the calm and humble life, but it certainly brought success to his son, if not to him. Okay, and why is this a significant story, though? So, so I think the significance comes from the reason why anyone would think that there is this kind of value attached to that note, which is very brief and, as you say, not really the most original of Einstein's thoughts. <laughs> I suppose in a way, Mike, it's the beginning of the cult of celebrity, isn't it? Well, okay, it was 1940 and they didn't have reality TV then. As we just heard from that public information film, things are very different. But he was a proper international megastar, Einstein. He was. I mean, there's two points to that we've been talking about. It's like the tipping culture in Japan, they don't take money and they would refuse. So actually him saying, him giving a note is very polite and very quirky let's say i'm glad you said that because it could be seen as arrogant couldn't it <laughs> especially to then give a note that says how humble you are no it's, it's quite it's quite a polite thing but also i think it looking at einstein himself i mean he is gonna go down in, as one of the world's most quotable and most famous people because of his character and let's be honest not just the science there's everything else around it i mean i looked online this morning we we're talking about the memorabilia side of celebrity and if he's got his own einstein.biz licensing and image rights website mm. where if you wanted a quote or a mug or a clip, you have to go through that. And that's big money. And that's the brand of Einstein. And this is why that money, this mm. is why it's gone like I that. I think he's, yeah, he must be the only winner of the Nobel Prize for physics whose name and image you could bandy around in mainstream cinema, in tabloid newspapers, in children's books. And he's instantly recognised and almost a sort of shorthand for science. science. I mean, uh, yeah, I was going to go any further. I mean, someone's going to chime in here and prove me wrong immediately. But is he possibly the only recognisable scientist to the majority of people, apart from Stephen Hawking. I think you're talking Stephen Hawking and Professor Brian Cox, aren't you, basically? And Brian Cox is... He's more of a TV... Let's be I honest, mean, he is a, be obviously he is a scientist, yeah. but is famous for being a TV presenter yeah. who, about science rather than as a scientist. But actually, Stephen Hawking is the obvious modern example, isn't it? In a, in a similar way, you could take just his image and everyone would know who that was. It's nothing to do with what he thinks. I mean, most people haven't read his book because they don't understand it. I mean, it's the same <laughs> with Einstein, isn't it? People just think, really clever person. And I do think that is part of the reason for the value of this note. It's not, it's not just the celebrity, but it's the nature of the celebrity and the nature of the message itself. So there was another note that said where there's a will there's a way i was knocking it out at that, that point wasn't that, <laughs> that sold in the same auction this week but for much less for a sixth of the value so there is something intrinsic in this message and i think it might it might be the sense that we're getting a lesson on life from somebody who's studied the workings of the universe and must have some kind of a special insight and even if what we end up with is slightly platitudinous it still feels as if it has greater import because it kind of taps into the the cult of Einstein and how he spent his life yeah so maybe actually this isn't as I was saying earlier about celebrity and it is more about a replacement for religion people look to people who understand the universe and the beginning of the world in particular Einstein and Stephen Hawking both do that don't they and think they must have something more to say than just the equations well you don't really want to take Einstein as your guide for life I can just be slightly controversial he wasn't a very nice person sometimes. First Thinking, Roald Dahl. No, first Roald, I'm, I'm just I'm just shooting them all down. But well, you know when we were uh, you know reading around about Einstein and this note that sold for all this money, and there was a um, a letter that he sent to his first wife before they and they eventually end up divorcing while they're in the process of trying to patch up their marriage it was a list of conditions for the continuation of their marriage. It starts off things like you'll ensure that my clothes and laundry are kept in good order. It's disgusting to the modern eye, but fine. It was a different time. 
You will renounce all personal relations with me, including my sitting at home with you and my going out with you, and you will not expect any intimacy from me, nor will you reproach me, and you will stop talking to me if I request it. You will leave my bedroom or study immediately without protest if I request it. I do. This, I mean, this, this is not... What I am trying to get at with this is that Einstein, for all his scientific genius, possibly not the sort of person we should be looking to for advice on a happy and content life. Although perhaps if she had followed all of these conditions rather than getting divorced, he would have had a content life for himself. Probably not life lessons for the majority. No, but I suppose it's... People know, don't they, because he was a Jewish emigre from Hitler as well. People know that there was struggle there in his family circumstance. So again, a bit like Stephen Hawking, there's this sense of he's overcome something personal, whatever he's like as a, a, an, an individual. I think his life story does have a lot to do with how he's looked back on now, particularly the Second World War, and not just his story as, as a refugee, but also the atomic weapon which built on the work that he had done earlier in his life. And after the Second World War, he went on to campaign for the um, creation of the United Nations. And so, although in 1940, he was, in the clip we heard, he was talking about the the difficulty of science influence politics, he did actually end up managing to transcend that, not least, I think, because he was able to work with people's emotions in a way that he was suggesting it's quite difficult for scientists to do. I guess as well, Mike, science has got sort of Harder. No, not to say that Einstein was doing anything straightforward, but back then, if you wanted to be a scientist, you could just focus on the science. And as Holden says, there are repercussions to what you did. But now everything's argued about, isn't it? If you look at climate change, for example, it, even if someone came up with the perfect equation, <laughs> you know, it's not that simple anymore. No, I mean, I suppose with, with, with science as well, I suppose the fields have broadened and there's more subjects to tackle. But there's also people want results quicker. And this is the other thing. I mean, if you look at any research lab of any university, they could be looking at the biggest things in life, whether it's tackling cancer or finding a cure for something. But the fact is, the way the world is, it wants to be quick and it wants to be now. And that puts pressure. I mean, would the kids that are, who could be the next next Stephen Hawking or next Einstein, are they going into gaming or are they going into technology? You know, that's probably another talking point altogether. And there's also all the kind of phony science, isn't there, which we've discussed before, the kind of press releases dressed up as science. You know, we've worked out exactly how much milk you should put in your all brand or whatever it is. I mean, that's a bit of fun for the paper, but it actually dilutes... <laughs> the sense of what real science is. That uh, may actually be partly Einstein's fault, I suspect, indirectly, because because of the, the, the sort of iconic nature of E equals MC squared, there is this sort of desire to express things in equations, even if they can't, if, even if they shouldn't be expressed as equations. And, you know, you have the ratio of the perfect spread of butter on a piece of toast, etc. And um, a lot of that is trying to replicate that pithy expression that Einstein was able to come up with. A calm and humble life will bring more happiness than the pursuit of success and the constant restlessness that comes with it. Discuss. I mean, let's just talk about what he actually wrote on the note, the thing that's worth the money. Is is that right? It's a kind of what you were saying earlier. You know, yeah, it's I cod often, philosophy. I, Einstein often repeats what I say. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that, you know, it's something you'd read on the side of a Starbucks cup, isn't it? It's, it's not a new sentiment at all. It's just a kind of dressed up, possibly cod Confucian type philosophy. It's probably not wrong, though. I don't disagree with any of that. But I think it is, it's a, you know, looking back at the first topic we were talking about, if more people were calm and humble, we probably would have fewer problems in the world. That's true. But the pursuit of success is the thing that many of us enjoy reading about others achieving as well. You know, what Einstein. Yes, exactly what Einstein did completely. I mean, you know, if you read a memoir, you're not interested in someone having a calm and balanced life, are you? You want to see them work through trauma and achieve something and really strive for it. There's something yeah, built in the richest that. stories. Yeah. The, is the ongoing Hollywood favourite, isn't it? So. Exactly. So you know, might bring a, a better book deal if not more happiness. <laughs> uh, Mike, what have you got for us this week? A big no-no for the big O's next tour. We'll do the regular show that we do, but in there somewhere will be um, the entire album. We we'll work mm-hmm. that up and and play that because it it really fits well with with everything. I don't think if you'd ever heard any of the songs, you wouldn't be able to tell which was the new from the old, which is really good. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, and a big European tour in the spring and a big uh, United States tour in the summer. So it's all go, go, go. 
Roy Orbison in his final interview back in 1988. Mike, Roy Orbison famously worked himself to death and now death is working for him. Tell us why. Right, okay, so it's been announced this week that a hologram version of Roy Orbison will be touring with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra around the UK for 10 gigs in April next year. Okay. It's not the first time this has happened. Tupac at Coachella, there's Michael Jackson at the Billboard Awards. But for me, I'm a huge Orbison fan, and I just think that, is this a bit strange? Is this a bit weird? And is this just the start of something that every dead artist's uh, estate is now going to do? Is this the first full-blown tour? Because Michael Jackson and Tupac were kind of one-off. Their appearances. Frank Zappa's also working on a tour, which might actually be out before that. (laughs) Another Frank angle. Sinatra is very busy as well. <laughs> Another angle to this is ABBA will be doing the same thing in 2019, and they're all still alive. Yeah, that's just lazy. <laughs> yeah. Actually, then Benny Anderson says it's perfect. We can be on stage while I'm walking home, walking the dogs at home, which is a bit weird. But talk about Orbison. The fact is, he has got the great, in my opinion, the best ever male voice, and it's not going to be the same as seeing him live. It's not ever going to be the same. But I suppose the point about being in a live audience watching an act that everyone loves is that there is more going on than just seeing the performance, isn't sure. there? I mean, the orchestra will no doubt be brilliant. I've seen them do normal... They won't be holograms. No, they're going to be no, very real. They'll be actual musicians. They're going to be very, very real. <laughs> they'll be brilliant, and it'll probably be a nice spectacle as a whole. But I have to live with the fact that I would never see Roy Orbison live in concert, and I'm not going to go to Bournemouth to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Or Doncaster, or Leeds, or wherever else it's <laughs> happening. Make it fair, yeah. Uh, do you think it matters, Rebecca? I mean, we, we have eSports is a thing now, isn't it, where people go yeah. and watch other people play video games? I'm totally the opposite. I think this is fantastic. I can't wait to get my tickets to see Hologram, Roy Orbison. You're going down to Bournemouth. a name. I must admit, I'm biased, though, because it's supposed to be this new technology that might change performance. But one of the things I remember doing when I was younger, I was very nerdy adolescent i went with my granny and granddad and my younger brother to see the rat pack show which is basically three guys pretending to be frank sinatra sammy davis jr and dean martin no 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 a lookalike is not the same it, it's exactly the same no it isn't it's not like it wasn't like a jukebox musical stars in their eyes wasn't performing holograms yeah, was but it? it wasn't the, their performers you, in their own right you were right. paying to see people reenact a famous show so they were doing the sands you know, kind of routine comedy and songs. It wasn't a jukebox musical type thing like telling a story and they were just playing characters. You were paying to see them reenact a famous show. And yeah. this is going to be an absolutely perfect version of that because it is it's the him. real thing, kind of. You know, at the heart, you're not watching someone pretend. I think this is brilliant. Why do you have to reconcile yourself to never seeing Roy Orbison in concert? Get down to, yeah, get down to Bournemouth. I can't do it. Perhaps I'll wait for ABBA. Who knows? <laughs> is it different if they're still alive? <laughs> yeah, I mean, could I that be so. the future? Are you going to see, like, Justin Bieber's hologram going out on tour? Because he could be in one place and the hologram could be touring in, like, ten other cities. Well, and, of course, that's what they do with Disney characters, isn't it? You know, Mickey Mouse is simultaneously in six different places around yeah. the Magic Kingdom. Why stop there? Yeah. But I think this is part of the problem. One of the reasons that we have so many OAP rockers on permanent tour is that live music is still lucrative in a way that recorded music isn't. Mm. But that's because there's a scarcity around live music that the performers can only be in one place at one time. And so people are prepared to pay for that experience. If Hollow Roy, let's call him, (laughs) if if Hollow Roy is in Bournemouth, he could also be in Doncaster and Tokyo and Denver and every other town or city in the world at the same time. And so that's just going to take away from the value of it, both for the economic value for the promoters, but also I think part of the appeal for the concert goer is that, only a certain number of people can be at the gig, and if you've got the ticket, you're one of them, and and, and everybody else. It's misses a different out. thing, though. I mean, that's a really legitimate point, I think. But I, I wonder if it just creates a new category, price-wise. You know, it's a bit like when you watch the live theatre broadcast at the cinema, isn't it? You know, that, that is yeah. priced more than a cinema ticket, but less than a theatre ticket. People appreciate it's special, but also you're not watching it live in person. I don't want. Roy's promoters to say and the 2020 tour is going to be held here across Europe and I think his legacy will live on because he's got great songs and the best voice but I just think that this with Tupac it was very unique because he was innovative Michael Jackson was innovative but I think with Roy Orbison I don't, would he have been into it? This is what I find strange. Would he have been into right. this sort of thing? I just don't think he would have been. He was a live performer and that was what he did. But Shakespeare might not have been into, you know, reinvigorated <laughs> performances of Julius Caesar, but I mean, he doesn't get a choice in it. The differences between this and the, the broadcast live theatre is that 
it is still a live event happening at that time. So there's an element of unpredictability about it. Whereas with a hologram performance, it's it's pre-recorded, it's pre-created. It's going to be the same every time it happens. And I think another appeal of the, the live performance is that you, the performer is interacting to a certain extent with the audience who he or she might be performing songs in a different way having a different take on them and that you're just not going to get that from a, a holographic but for me Roy Orbison he wasn't someone who ran around the stage he stood there and strummed his guitar and that was it I mean so with a with a rock he who was ran a around the stage yeah well <laughs> but is it just going to be a bit boring seeing that I would rather just to see an old Roy Orbison concert put back through the studio and put on into cinemas make it watch it that way that would be better for me i think there's definitely a big difference between a kind of novelty one-off appearance like we had with tupac and michael jackson and actually monetizing it into a tour i do wonder i hadn't thought about it before but what holden was saying like part of the appeal of going to see something live is you don't know exactly what's going to happen maybe they'll bring someone on maybe they'll cover a song that you wouldn't think they'd have covered maybe something crazy will happen oh, That's maybe not someone happen. will have to press control alt delete i mean there are things that can go wrong with the holograph <laughs> maybe he could do a duet with tupac and tupac <laughs> <laughs> Tupac could rap over Only the Lonely. I would <laughs> hate to see that. Is he going to be in black and white, actually, in all seriousness? I don't actually know. I'm actually honest. I mean, I suppose there is that, isn't there? You've only seen black and white footage for the most part. I know he died in the 80s, but for the most part of his classic performances. So that his, would be... Yeah, his last performance was in colour. And that was an award show, I think, in Singapore, which was... And that was for for Pretty Woman because that was the, uh, one of the later songs. But I don't... I, I Honestly, his, his main recording in the last few years, which we re-released, was the black and white recording of the gig mm. in the 60s, which was his famous one. So, yeah, you're right. It probably his will be... wardrobe, though, there's probably not that much of a difference between Roy Orbison in <laughs> no. colour or black and white. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think my favourite comment on this story under the Guardian piece was this is going to be a fantastic episode of Black Mirror when it's finished. <laughs> Which is exactly what it feels Imagine like. Imagine he would just get up and walk off the stage and they'd all be pressing the buttons going, he's not supposed to do that, he's not supposed to do that. <laughs> he's gone rogue. He's like choking someone in the front row. <laughs> would you be interested in interviewing a holographic Roy Orbison, Mike? Not really, Are no. you're a fan? I am a great the opportunity fan. comes up, you can interview him now for the week online. Would you do it? Yeah, why not? Ten minute junket in a Bournemouth hotel room. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, let's do it. It should be fun. <laughs> Enjoy. Uh, that is it from this edition of The Week Unwrapped. My thanks to Mike Starling, boss man Holden Frith and Rebecca Gilly. Uh, for more from The Week, why not visit theweek.co.uk where you can also sign up to our free email newsletter, The Week Day. Uh, or of course, you can have the magazine delivered direct to your door. Just head to theweek.co.uk slash subscribe. Remember, all the past episodes of this show are available on our podcast feed, holograms are not supported just search for the week unwrapped on your app of choice i've been ollie man our music is by tom morby the producer matt hill at rethink audio until we meet again to unwrap next week bye-bye